हाँ जी प्लीज स्टार्ट करें गुड आफ्टरनून लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन स्ट्रेंथ एंड कंडीशनिंग प्रोग्राम्स हैव मेड कॉम्पिटिटिव एथलेटिक्स मोर एक्सप्लोजिव एंड मोर एक्साइटिंग एस एथलीट्स हैव मेड ग्रेट इंप्रूवमेंट्स इन स्ट्रेंथ एंड पावर स्पीड एंड बॉडी कंट्रोल one of the greatest factors to have affected sports has been incorporation of organized strength and conditioning programs into professional athletic programs many national federations teams athletes today have conditioning staffs to meet the increased demand placed on the strength and conditioning training sai is trying to do everything possible to keep the standard of coaches current on the latest research and its application in the field through online webinars hello and welcome to today's webinar strength and conditioning for strength and power sports first of all i welcome our honorable minister of sports and youth affairs independent charge mr kiran rajuji for taking time from his busy schedule and accepting our invitation to be the guest of honor and also to inaugurate this webinar thank you sir for being here with us today our sports minister has been the guiding light behind all the verticals of sai coaching and education programs his thoughts and directions have led us to alternative measures to keep our athletes and coaches in the right spirit even at this epidemic times on behalf of sports authority of india i welcome you to the first webinar on strength and conditioning for strength and power sports our voyage to achieve excellence in sports would not be so glittering without the support of our beloved director general of sai mr sandeep pradhan ji his constant encouragement and support from time to time has enabled us to organize this webinar in the most befitting way during this pandemic time sir i all heartily welcome you to this webinar in our webinar we have eminent speakers and experienced strength and conditioning specialists from australia germany singapore japan russia malaysia and india i bid a sincere welcome to all of them we have about 400 selected national coaches assistant coaches dronacharya wadis international medalists strength and conditioning specialists specially invited from various national sports federation sai officials and coaches and dignitaries from other state agencies gathered here today making our webinar a truly multidisciplinary and to a standard of an international one i welcome you all to this webinar last but not least i would also like to acknowledge our senior director captain ak bhel sports authority of india bangalore and all the supporting staff of sai head office and sai bangalore for their continuous support with which without which it would not have been possible for organizing this mega event the theme of this webinar is strength and conditioning for strength and power sports with many research activities now taking on global dimension it is imperative to discuss positive approaches towards inculcating best applied research practices in the field of strength and conditioning the purpose of this webinar is to educate the coaches and strength condition strength and conditioning specialists in india and enable them to stay abreast of evolving knowledge and skills in the profession and to promote the ongoing competency periodic reporting of continuing education is needed to ensure that the coaches are continuing continually competent bridging the gap between the exercise science research and its practical application in the field of strength and conditioning is a gray area of concern presently now i request our director general sports authority of india sri sandeep pradhan ji to address the gathering thank you dr saju uh, at the outset i welcome our honorable minister of state for sports kiran rajju sir to this seminar sir has been a constant guide and motivates us encourages us to conduct carry out new and new activities so sir to just give a background dr saju uh, was earlier with sai in the initial days and then went to malaysia and he was head of the department for biomechanics and research in the institute national institute of 
Malaysia. So he has a wide experience of biomechanics and strength and conditioning. So he, we have chosen him as a, as a director uh, for this particular program. And he's working now with us as a high performance director based at Bangalore. So uh, earlier we carried out a program for uh, a game specific. So we had two sessions. One was a game specific coaching and another session used to be the sports science. So that program was quite general in nature. And now we thought that it is a time that we give a higher level knowledge to our uh, athlete, uh, to the coaches of various disciplines. So when we discussed, it came out that it is better that we club certain sports, say maybe power sports together and have the program. And obviously, uh, the few elements we need to uh, inculcate amongst the coaches, one of them is strength conditioning, other could be rehabilitation or recovery, and maybe nutrition, or basic elements of nutrition that all the ex coaches are also expected to know. I'm with, very, very uh, delighted, sir, and rather, I would say, honored to see very eminent faces, uh, one of them being Anji Wabi George, who has been the name, I don't need to introduce her. She is also uh, sitting here as a part of the seminar. So welcome all the participants, all international medalists, all the coaches, eminent coaches, distinguished coaches, who, and, and the, the eminent people who have contributed a lot in the field of sports. I welcome all of you. I congratulate the team uh, led by Rachana Govil and Captain Bahel and Dr. Saju, who uh, in a, such a short time has given a shape to the seminar. Sir, uh, just to give a background, uh, we had received a lot of applications. So this has not been kept open for everyone. A uh, lot of applications uh, were received, I think more than 1,200. And then our team has shortlisted around three, uh, 370, but I can see 400 people attending the seminar. So there is a lot of popularity. And it is not just because of pandemic we are now organizing the, the program. In future, we certainly plan to have a physical program uh, maybe at Bangalore, maybe at Patiala, uh, for various uh, facets of sports science, including sports science, uh, including strength conditioning, nutrition. And I'm sure all the coaches, Indian coaches, I can see a lot of enthusiasm amongst Indian coaches and ex-athletes to grab the knowledge, uh, you know, and to strengthen the knowledge to reach to a higher level where uh, they can uh, train the elite athlete. Uh, so without wasting much of the time, I'll request Honorable Minister, sir, to address the gathering. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sandeep ji, our uh, Director General of the Sports Authority of India, and um, Dr. Saju, mm -hmm. and the uh, officials, <coughs> our uh, experts, the former athletes, and our guests from uh, other countries who are being made to contribute in this online uh, program, which has been launched uh, for the strength and conditioning for the strength and power sports. I think uh, this is a one of its kind, uh, which we have been thinking for a long time to have it. I personally feel that we all know about strength and conditioning and uh, how much it is important for the strength and power sports. But somehow in India, we, we were not able to drive, uh, particularly in a focused manner in this field. And what I'm told is uh, during this uh, online program, our experts will be talking about how to move forward in strength and conditioning in more scientific manner which has to be long term planned and executed as per the uh, program is being set. I, I feel that in, the, in, the, in this particular field, lots of our past athletes will realize that it was not adequately been taken care of in India. So many a times, some of our athletes had to undergo lots of difficulties. Sometimes they had to uh, move out of India to really understand and tackle the, uh, the nagging problems. Because this is power sports is something you try to push beyond the limit of your strength. You try to reach another level. 
For example, in weightlifting, it's just one jerk which decides the entire result. And while trying to push beyond the limit, because you know, if you can't push beyond the limit, you lose. If push beyond the limit, you win. Such is the margin. So in that kind of situation, unless you are trained scientifically, properly taken care of all the requirement, there is a great danger, not only of losing, but for the permanent effect on the body. Many of our uh, top athletes had to endure the pain and agony of injury. And it has led to um, curtailing of the sports career itself. So I think uh, this is something in India, we are a late starter. It's not that in India we have not understood this thing or not, not been done before, but it was not done in a manner in which we are thinking and which you have planned it up now. I think this is a very good beginning. I'm happy also that I'm part of it and on this uh, launching event, I'm uh, part of it to inaugurate. I feel it will uh, you know, take us a long way into this field of strength and condi conditioning. Even if people like us who don't play sports, who are not professional athletes, we also you know, require to understand this thing. It's not only for the hardcore athletes. I think for everybody at any level of age in the, in the life of a person, I think this is applicable. How much strength somebody has to apply, to what extent, without any risk. These are, I think, uh, for as a matter of common sense, I'm sure it is a matter which is applicable to everyone. But for the athletes, for the pro professional sports persons, it is absolutely necessary. There's no denying in that. So I'm also happy that the many experts from our friendly countries, Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, Japan, and uh, uh, Germany have joined us. I think we will get uh, lots of benefits from them because these are some of the countries who have progressed quite well in terms of research, in terms of understanding the power sports, or the strength and conditioning for the st uh, strength and power sports. And they have been doing quite good in the international level of competition, be it Olympics or in the world level. So India will benefit a lot from these experiences. And I also look forward that in future, we have better collaboration with some of the countries. I always uh, uh, feel that in our relationship with another country, the relationship in sports and youth affairs plays a very important role. So it's a sharing of our information, sharing of uh, experiences, sharing of knowledges, it's very important. And in the days to come, I'm sure in India, we will also um, make a good mark in this sector. So without uh, taking much time, because you are going to discuss in details in the ensuing this online session. So I will not speak anything about that further, uh, but I also give my best wishes to everyone for enriching this um, online session. And uh, primarily our coaches, our coach, we are having a large number of coaches now in India. So the coaches will also will have to keep themselves updated. It's a, like a continuous flow of knowledge. You can't stop it. So everyone has to keep themselves updated with uh, new research, new training, new experience. So I think this uh, particular session will be very useful for our coaches. And at the end, this will benefit our athletes. So I'm also happy to learn some of our athletes like um, Anju also has joined and uh, uh, many more, I'm sure. I'm not aware how many of uh, you are here on this online now, but very happy to learn that many have joined and they will also share their experiences.
especially those athletes who had uh, faced many difficulties, physical challenges in their prime time, will also be able to share uh, their experiences as well as solutions also. So this is a great occasion. My best wishes to everyone. And I compliment our team, our uh, team uh, in Sai, in Bangalore, and um, uh, Dr. Saju, and our team, our Sai team in uh, Bangalore, and everybody, those who are part of this arrangement, they deserve a big appreciation for putting these things together and make uh, this imp important gathering, which will be an epoch making progress in our quest to make India a great sports powerhouse. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We are honored by the presence of Sports Minister Shira Kiran Rijijiji. The sports fraternity of India indeed is indebted by your spirit and ent enthusiasm for sports and sportsmen, sir. We are singularly thankful to you for encouraging initiatives taken by Sports Authority of India. We feel honored by your presence and would like to assure you that we shall leave no stone unturned towards making India a sporting nation. There could not have been a better way to kickstart this program. We thank you once again, sir, for this. While the world is busy facing the challenge of COVID-19, our Director General Sri Sandeep Pradhan formulated a way of converting the challenge into an opportunity by using technology to improve knowledge and expertise of our coaches through this online webinar. Director General, sir, we are indeed thankful for your foresight, prudence, and support in making this program happen and also inspiring and guiding for such endeavors. I would like to thank the creator and curator of this program, Dr. Saju Joseph, who has got this program into a successful start. And we have today with us experts from Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, Germany, Japan, and almost around the globe, enriching us with their knowledge and experience. I would like to extend my gratitude to all the experts across the India and world who happily agreed to be a part of this initiative by Sports Authority of India. I would also like to thank all the officials and staff who had worked day and night to prepare this program for us. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the coaches who are willingly, who have be willingly become part of this program. I wish this endeavor of ours will help in improving performance of our athletes and will help our country to fly our flag at Olympics high and with pride. Thank you, Jahid. I request Project Director Dr. Saju Joseph to take on the program here on. Thank you, sir. Uh, to all our participants, finally, before the session starts, I encourage all coaches and strength and conditioning specialists to participate actively in this webinar over the next seven days. I wish everyone a successful and rewarding benefits of this webinar. Thank you. In a short while, we are about to start the first session of this webinar. Basker, uh, can you just ask uh, Professor to share the screen? <laughs> Professor, can. Okay. Uh, Dear participants, we'll be running a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. That means, so we have enabled our chat feature. It is on the bottom side of your screen. So if you have any questions, just pop them in there. And if you miss anything, don't worry. We'll be sending around the on-demand recording in YouTube. And also, if you have any questions, you can post it to me. And I will... Uh, Posted to Dr. Prof, I mean, Professor Ken Nozaka, and then we get the answers for that. Okay, our first session for today, our first speaker is Professor Ken Nozaka. Uh, he worked in Japan for nearly 20 years before relocating to Edith Cohen University in Australia in 2004. He received PhD from Yokohama City University Medical School in 1995. At Edith Kovan University, he coordinated postgraduate research programs of exercise and sports science. 
director at the center of a uh, center for exercise and sports science research from 2007 to 2012 and currently he is the director of exercise and sports science he received the vice chancellor's award for excellence in research supervision in 2008 and again in 2012 he is the first person who has pioneered and designed a gym only for eccentric strength training. He has innovated most of the eccentric equipment in the gym. Probably I think he will show a slide of that uh, gym. Then another uh, feature is that Qantas Airline, Australian, Australian airliner has patented its protocol for a set of eccentric exercise for passengers who are bound for long hours of flight. He has published more than 280 peer-reviewed journal articles and about 80% of them are associated with the eccentric exercise, which is the topic of his talk for today and tomorrow. His talk for today is entitled Eccentric Exercises, Char Characteristics and Applications. Let us welcome Professor Ken Nosaka for his presentation. Okay. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Dr. Saju. It is special thanks to you uh, giving me this opportunity. So my name is Ken Nosaka. So today's talk is eccentric exercise, characteristics and applications. So I'm talking for about one number, then followed by questions and answers. Okay, so first, my brief history. So I used to be a sprinter. I have never run against the same board, but actually I was in Japan at the time. Then my question when I was a sprinter was, how should I train my muscles to run 100 and 200 meters faster? My answer at that time, long time ago, was no pain, no gain. I need to damage my muscle to get stronger and get faster. But I know this was wrong. Because of this kind of wrong theory, my 100 time did not improve so much from my high school to university, only 0.2 seconds. 20 meters, a little bit better, but not that national level at all. Also, I often had muscle soreness after training, after competition. Then I asked uh, my question to my seniors, what is the cause of muscle pain after training, after competition? My senior said, it is common sense, lactic acid. But later on, I found this was not correct. So that motivated me to study more about excellent sports science. Then and I went after my finishing my bachelor degree for physical education. I went to the master of education at Tokyo Gakuge University. Then my mentor was Professor Ono. He was a medical doctor. Then he taught me many things. He taught me how to think, uh, how to think and how to kind of generate kind of new knowledge. And then um, I got the position at the Oklahoma City University, then uh, starting from lecturer, then became a sort of professor. Then I worked there for 15 years. So during that period, I was able to go to University of Massachusetts for two years, then studied under Dr. Priscilla Clarkson. Unfortunately, she passed away several years ago because of breast cancer, but she was my mentor. She taught me how to do research. Then I came back to Yokohama State University Medical School, and then I got a PhD in 1995. Then my PhD topic was creating kinase, which is a kind of indicator of muscle damage in the blood and muscle uh, damage. I'm going to talk about this one today. And then um, in 2000, this is a Sydney Olympic year, I had a sabbatical, like a study leave at Edith Cohen University. Because uh, at Edith Cohen University, a PhD student was doing a kind of similar study to my area, muscle damage. Then he asked me to come to work with him. Then I came to Edith Cohen University for one year. Then I really liked uh, the atmosphere of the university and also especially the path was a very beautiful place. Then I wanted to come back to Perth someday. Then in 2003, uh, ECU, Edith Cowan University, advertised a position for Associate Professor for Excellent Sports Science. 
then apply for it. And luckily, I got the position for three years. But um, I got kind of promoted. Then I'm still at the Ediscar University for 16 years. This is my brief history. So my um, specialty or expertise is exercise and sports science. So what is exercise and sports science? When we say exercise science, focus is more for physical activities and exercises. Then target is more individuals with general population, aged population, children, clinical population, and children, focusing more for health and fitness. When we say sports science, this is more for sports. Like today, so many listeners are coaches, so you are area. So we are focusing on athletes, means that the elite athlete, professional athlete, recreational athlete, and also handicapped athletes. Then we are caring for their performance, how to improve performance. But good thing about excellent sports science, we can apply the kind of same kind of theory and mechanisms to both directions. So even you are focusing on excellent sports science, uh, excellent science, you can use this knowledge to sports science and vice versa. Vice versa. So, uh, this exercise for science is to better understand exercise and sports and eventually our body. This is what we are doing. So this is me. So uh, if you are interested in my research, you can just hit Google Scholar, then type Kazunori Nosaka. This is my actual name, Kazunori Ken is my nickname. Then uh, you can see my previous publications. But my main topic is eccentric exercise. This is what I'm going to cover today and tomorrow. So first, I will just start from research is everyone's business. So uh, almost the listeners are coaches. So you are doing great job, which is great. But I think research is very important component in your coaching. Um, for example, so we are going to understand phenomena or maybe an um, overall phenomena. Okay, so we are doing a lot of descriptive studies. And also we try to get the fact, for example, what kind of training works well, and what kind of training does not work. Okay, and then um, when we get more fact, we try to find the mechanisms underpinning the phenomena. Then we are doing some mechanic studies. Then we are going to find that cause for the fact. Then uh, we are trying to find the truth. What is the truth? Then we are connecting two, and then we are going to do systematic, uh, systematic uh, process of collecting and analyzing information or data to increase our understanding of the phenomena, which is science. Okay. However, I think good coach should be or must be a good researcher because you are dealing with athletes and then uh, investigating their movement or their responses to training then you are trying to find a fact and also trying to find a better way for the training, which is exactly the science. So a good coach must be a good researcher. This is what I think. But truth is very difficult. What is truth? So, um, so theory, or maybe some kind of training kind of a, a theory is moving around. Sometimes some people say good, but some people say it's not good. Then eventually, it is maybe in the middle. So unfortunately, truth is not that simple. So uh, what kind of treatment, what kind of training, what kind of coaching, what kind of practice is good is depending on the situation. So if we know this training can work for everybody, sports is not interesting at all. Okay? Even for the same training, uh, one athlete can respond very well, but other one may not be like that. So coaches are trying to find out why. So that's why sports is very interesting, I think. So today and tomorrow, I'm not going to give you anything you should do this one, but I can give you just hints what you could do. So, and also interpretation of the data is very important. So we have to check individual carefully. So, uh, for example, this is the data. For example, this is a kind of one group, this is the other group. So this is a statistical analysis showing maybe difference between group A and group B. But when looking at the individual 
subject the participants. So a lot of overlapping here for this data. Or maybe only one person can make this big difference. Or there are a lot of people similar, but two can buy modal response. One is kind of more and one is lower. Or maybe just uneven or unequal number of the participants. So this is come to this data. But uh, until we are looking at each individual, we don't know the actual meaning of this data. Also, this is more uh, uh, kind of applicable for your uh, coaching situation. This is before and after training, for example. So in this case, all of your athletes responded similarly, then all of them showed increase. This is very nice. But this exactly the same data could be coming from this one. Some of them are improving a lot. Some of them are not changing so much. Some of them are decreasing, kind of. A uh, lot of different responses. Okay, okay. This is a uh, uh, one pe uh, group is responding very well, other are not. So this could be like this situation. So individual athletes matter. So as a coach, of course, you are dealing with individual athletes. Then we also need to know what makes individual differences. So uh, science is more talking about the group, but for coaches, and you need to look at individual more. So this is a, a kind of a statistical analysis method called magnitude-based inference. So this area is beneficial. So let's say some training is very beneficial for athletes. So this is trivial, it may be not beneficial, but not harmful, okay? This is harmful. Okay, so here you can see when you athletes do this training, 99% of the athletes can have a beneficial effect. This is almost certainly beneficial. This is good training probably. And also this is some people, this is maybe 7% out of 100% did not respond to this training, but other 93% responded to training, which is also good. So what about this one? So this one, Okay, so about 33% uh, of the athletes did not respond. But 65% of the athletes showed some improvement. Is this a good training? Maybe depending on the situation. Also, this is a little bit less. So maybe 59% did not respond, but 40% should respond. So this is a, uh, maybe uh, possibly trivial, but still 40% of the people showed some improvement, which may be good. So what about this? Okay, so in this situation, okay, this is unclear, but this means that the 31% of the athlete could show beneficial effect by some kind of training. 60% showed no effect. 9% showed harmful effect, negative effect. Are you going to use this training? Or this is a little bit kind of more complicated. So maybe this one, 57% of people have beneficial response, 36 people have trivial, and then 7% is harmful. Are you going to use this training? It could be depending on the situation. For example, uh, this is not the uh, example for the athletes, but let's say you have a cancer, okay? Then maybe you may, have only one year of your life. But if you are taking this drug, you could have some possible effect, but could it be no effect or maybe with a small chance of the harmful effect. But if my life is only for one year, I would like to try this medicine. Also, that's going to be the, also the case of athletes, maybe uh, Olympic Games, okay? So next Olympic Games held in Tokyo. So uh, if you are doing uh, this training, you could be successful, but you have a little bit chance to kind of get worse, but this chance is very low. So in this case, if athlete is not confident or maybe uh, not that good, maybe trying this training could be a good thing. So depending on the situation. This is what we need to think all the time. So how to interpret data is up to you, up to coaches. And right or wrong is not clear. 
only result can tell you whether it was good or not. That's why coaching is very interesting, I think. Okay, so look at these three pictures. Okay, what a common adjective to describe these three pictures. Actually, this is coming from eccentric or eccentric. If you just search by Google or something, you hit eccentric, you can find this kind of picture somewhere, Einstein somewhere, or this kind of going downstairs picture somewhere. So eccentric means uh, uncommon, abnormal, or strange, or weird, okay? So eccentric means something wrong, something strange. So this person's costume is strange, or uh, Einstein was considered to be an extraordinary uh, scientist. Why this is eccentric? This is a typical eccentric exercise. So other meaning of eccentric is not placed centrally or not having it access to other part based uh, placed centrally. So it comes to excellence for science. It is a lengthening muscle contraction. So this is going downstairs walking is a typical eccentric exercise. So when we define muscle contraction, there are three types. One is, okay, this is the muscle, muscle generating force, this is the load to the muscle. If force is equal to load, it is called isometric contraction, static contraction. Muscle does not move so much, still shorten, but joint does not move. When force is greater than load, muscle can shorten which is concentric contraction. Eccentric contraction is opposite. Force is smaller than load, then activated muscle is lengthened. This is called eccentric contraction. So in this particular uh, lecture, when I say eccentric exercise, it means that the exercise mainly consisting of eccentric muscle contraction, eccentric muscle action. So, Typical eccentric exercise. So you are sitting there for, I don't know, maybe 40 minutes. So just try to stand up, please. Okay, try to stand up. Okay, then sitting to chair slowly, very slowly. Good. Okay, when you stood up, you are flowing time as a short, which is concentric contraction. Okay, but when you are sitting to a chair slowly, your front thigh muscles are lengthened. This is called typical eccentric exercise of the knee extensors. So you are doing eccentric exercise every day. Whenever you sit down to a chair or sofa, you are doing eccentric exercise. So eccentric exercise, not the kind of strange exercise at all. You are doing this one every day. But my point is that we need to focus this one more. Okay, so there are many types of eccentric contractions. So we're going down slope. This is downhill running. Or Nordic hamstrings are typical eccentric exercise. This is sit up, but maybe you have to lower your body slowly to the uh, floor. Uh, sit up as a push up, maybe more to going down to the floor. The dumbbell, you need to lower the dumbbell slowly. And also chin up, you have to lower your body slowly. So these are eccentric exercises, okay? And this is typical eccentric exercise too. This is eccentric cycling. There's a motor inside. So motor is going backwards, but you are trying to go forward, but eventually your kind of leg is going backwards, kind of a pedaling. So then in this case, your front thigh must the lengthen each time. This is called eccentric cycling. Okay, so we, I'm going to talk about characteristics of eccentric exercise. So as you can see here, so this is a picture from Malaysia. I think Saju know some of these people, I think. So this is a Malaysian rugby sevens team players. So here you can see 20 kilogram plates, 34, so 680 kilograms, okay? And also you can see some athlete on the top of the uh, leg press machine. And also they are holding like a, um, yeah, so barbell. I mean, they are holding the cut plates, okay? So this is about one ton, 1,000 kilograms. 
So when we ask them to, uh, from here, to just push their leg, they can do 600 kilograms or so, which is still very large. But when once they are strengthening their knee, okay, I mean, straightening their knee, they ask them to lower this weight. They can do one ton, 1,000 kilograms. So we can produce much greater force for eccentric contraction than concentric. So this is me, okay? So I can lower the dumbbell about 20 kilograms, but I cannot lift 20 kilograms. I can lift only 15. So this is the average of 60 men. So uh, very similar to mine. So concentric RM is 15 kilo, eccentric RM is 20 kilo or so. So we can produce 20 to 30% greater force during eccentric contraction than concentric. This is one of the interesting characteristics of eccentric exercise. So this one is a, a kind of long kind of time ago. So they tried to uh, do eccentric cycling by putting two bicycles together. So bicycle here is going forward, normal concentric cycling. Then eventually their chain is connected. So this is going backwards. This is eccentric cycling. This was done in 1952, more than uh, closely 70 years ago. So they found that during eccentric cycling, they required much lower oxygen than concentric cycling. So eccentric cycling, this metabolically demanding the concentric. So we uh, kind of did the same study using more modern bicycle. So this is eccentric cycling going backwards. So this is concentric cycling going forward. So for the same work output, about 160 watts, eccentric cycling will have 50% less oxygen to perform the same work than concentric cycling. And then second time they did, like two weeks later, still 50% less oxygen was necessary. Heart rate, concentric cycling is about 160 uh, beats per minute, but eccentric cycling, first time, 19% uh, lower heart rate. Then two weeks later, they did that same eccentric exercise, 30% lower. So definitely eccentric exercise is much metabolically less demanding than concentric exercise. For example, if you are going upstairs, which is concentric exercise, you are panting, your heart rate is going up. But when you are going downstairs, it is much easier, which is eccentric. And then this is the EMG. We put some electrodes on the muscle to uh, investigate muscle activation. So muscle activation is much less during eccentric contraction compared to the concentric contraction. So muscle is used less during contraction. This is one of the reasons why we need less energy. And also during eccentric contraction, it is more difficult. So heart rate are definitely lower for the eccentric, but this is the target from the error, error from the target. So we ask them to cycle at the same target, but during eccentric cycling, uh, error occurs more from the target. Second time, a little better, but still much greater error than the concentric. Then we ask the participant to react, to respond to the uh, uh, number. For example, on the computer screen, one to nine number is coming up. Then we can ask them to, for example, when you see four, number four, you need to press the button. Then control condition without any cycling, they can, their kind of reaction time is 0.55 seconds. But during concentric cycling, 0.6 seconds, a little bit slower, slow, uh, like a slower, slow response. But when they are doing eccentric contraction, eccentric cycling, uh, reaction time is much uh, kind of um, delayed, like 0 0.7 seconds. And then error occurs more. For example, they need to hit the button at four, but sometimes they hit the button at five or seven or something like that, error occurs more. So this means that the eccentric exercise is more cognitively demanding than concentric exercise. So maybe we can stimulate the brain better by eccentric exercise. And then one of the negative aspects of eccentric cycling in this case is muscle damage. So muscle damage occurs only after eccentric cycling. 
So after concentric cycling, strength decreases a little bit, but back to normal by, this is one day, but actually a couple of hours later. But after the first bout of eccentric cycling, strength decreases greater, then does not recover until five, three or four days. So this prolonged decrease in strength is a typical indicator of muscle damage. And also muscle soreness does not occur, does not develop after concentric cycling, but only develop after eccentric cycling. However, if you repeat the same eccentric cycling second time, two weeks later, no muscle soreness occurs and the strength recovery is much faster. So, prolonged loss of muscle strength and delayed onset muscle soreness, this is called DOMS, as peculiar to uh, custom eccentric exercise. So these are considered to be the symptoms of muscle damage. However, when same exercise is repeated several weeks later, these symptoms are attenuated or much reduced. So as I uh, showed in the previous uh, slide, so delayed also muscle is a typical indicator of muscle damage. Also prolonged loss of muscle function or muscle strength is also indicator of muscle damage. Other one is uh, maybe increasing blood uh, markers, uh, such as creating kinase myoglobin in the blood is an indicator of muscle damage. Also, sometimes muscle becomes stiffer after eccentric exercise, and also muscle swelling could occur after eccentric exercise. For this one, maybe this arm is uh, swollen because of the eccentric exercise. If we, we can use uh, uh, ultrasound or MRI, we can visualize muscle damage by increasing echo intensity or increasing T2 relaxation time. But direct mark of muscle damage, of course, uh, historical changes in the muscle, in the muscle filament level or muscle fiber level, or extracellular matrix level. So I'm going to talk about this one first. So in this particular study uh, done in, uh, this is Norway, okay? So young kind of men, okay, participate, uh, uh, performed 30 sets of 10 maximal voluntary eccentric contractions or knee extensors. So 300 maximal eccentric contractions, which is very tough. Then they took the biopsy from the knee extensors, especially the vastus lateralis. They found that disruption of muscle is occurring only for the exercise leg, immediately after exercise, 24 hours and 96 hours after exercise. But no exercise leg did not show any damage. This means that maybe 40, about 40% 40 of muscle fiber somewhat damaged like that. So ultrastructure damage occurs after eccentric exercise. However, when looking at muscle fiber level, this is excellent leg. So this one is a typical damaged muscle fiber. Inflatory, uh, kind of, not of uh, inflammatory cells inside, okay, inside. So this is a typical indicator muscle fiber damage is found only less than 1% of the whole fibers. This is control, nothing, but only just small number of the muscle fiber damaged. So when we say muscle damage, not many muscle fibers are actually damaged, but myofilament level damage occurs more. But interestingly, they found that a lot of inflammatory cells are located outside the muscle cells, which means that maybe more damage occurs to the uh, connective tissue surrounding the muscle fibers. This is another study from Denmark. So one leg performed maximally voluntary eccentric contraction, other leg performed voluntary maximum eccentric contraction plus electrical stimulation. So they found that after maximal voluntary contraction, no muscle fiber damage were found. However, after um, voluntary, maximum voluntary plus electrical stimulated condition, these kind of, uh, kind of green fibers are damaged fibers. About 15% of muscle fibers are damaged. And also they found greater uh, changes in the myofilament level for this condition. However, no significant difference between this condition, this condition for muscle soreness. So this condition, more muscle fiber damaged, we tend to think this is more sore, but that was not the case. Soreness is the same between the two. And interestingly, much greater strength also occurred for voluntary contraction than Electroestimated condition. 
So strength also is much greater for this image, no muscle fiber damage. So this indicates that histological changes do not represent symptoms of muscle damage. So when you have soreness, you should not think that maybe many muscle fibers actually damaged. Okay, that is not true. So how we can assess muscle damage? So this is a, a kind of called visual analog scale, just maybe 10 millimeter, 10 centimeter line. Then we can ask them to just indicate the uh, pain level. When we palpate or we ask them to stretch the muscle or we then ask them to contract the muscle. So this is a kind of visual scale to um, quantify um, the level of muscle damage, level of muscle soreness. And also we can uh, use this kind of device. This is called pressure uh, pain threshold meter. We can put the, push the muscle, then we can ask them to just respond when they felt pain. So normally uh, when you are kind of putting this one kind of gently, no pain occurs, but when muscle is very sore, if even gent kind of pressure can induce soreness. So also uh, we develop a methods to um, assess electrical pain threshold. We can insert a very thin needle uh, to the uh, muscle or maybe fascia or inside the muscle. Then we deliver the current. And then we can check how much current, how many current is necessary to induce pain. So this is the result. So after eccentric exercise of the elbow flexors, fast bulk eccentric exercise, we see large increase in muscle soreness in the bus scale, and also large decrease in pressure pain threshold. So muscle become more sensitive to the pressure, okay? And but second about performed four weeks later, not so much soreness occurs and pressure pain threshold did not change so much. So this is more interesting here. So when we put the needle to the uh, biceps fascia and also deep fascia, and also we put the uh, needle in, the, in between the two fascias. So if uh, fascia pain was more than, this is the fascia pain, than between the fascia. So it means that the fascia became more sensitive to the um, electrical stimulation, which means that the muscle soreness occurs more from the fascia than muscle. So we think that maybe connective tissue damage rather the muscle fiber damage are responsible for a pain, especially delayed onset muscle soreness. When we are taking an image uh, using MRI, we can visualize muscle damage by increasing echo intensity, uh, increasing the kind of a uh, relaxation time like that, okay? So this is uh, occurring, but interestingly, more damage type of response occurring six and 10 days rather than immediately after, or one, one or three days. This is same thing for the ultrasound. This is a much cheaper way to visualize muscle damage. This is a, a skin and then subcutaneous fat. And this is the biceps brachii. And this is the bone, okay? In between is brachialis. As you can see, before exercises, muscle thickness is not that big, but immediately after muscle thickness is increased because of swelling, and then one day back to a little bit normal. But as you can see, two to five days, you can see large increase in echo intensity, which could be due to the inflammation. So we can visualize muscle damage by ultrasound technique. We can also assess muscle damage by muscle uh, blood markers. We often use creatine kinase or myoglobin. And also we can measure contractile protein or other enzymes. So CK is a very large molecule. They cannot go to the lymph. They, they cannot go to the uh, bloodstream directly. They have to go through lymph. And myoglobin can go to the uh, bloodstream directly. So peak of myoglobin is earlier than CK. So in this exercise, so a subject performed nine different type of eccentric exercise. So one exercise targeting uh, elbow flexors, uh, elbow extensors, chest press for the uh, pector, uh, pectoral muscle, pectoralis muscle, and leg extension, leg curl for the uh, knee extensors and knee flexors, and also calf raids, 
a lot crew down, abdominal crunch, and back extension. So we try to damage whole body by this protocol. So subject performed nine exercises using 80% maximal isometric strength load, and then each exercise five sets of 10 reps. Okay, so this took a long time to finish this exercise. So then we saw huge increase in creatine kindness after nine exercises. But when they are doing the same exercise, uh, four weeks later, so two weeks later, no change in CK, no change in myoglobin. And also we found that troponin increase after eccentric exercise, but only troponin I, fast switch type, no switch, switch type troponin increase, which means that all muscle damage occurring to the fast switch fibers. So when you are doing eccentric exercise, then muscle damage occurs to only fast switch fibers. So in a way, this means that maybe when you are doing eccentric exercise, you are stimulating more fast switch fibers. So this slide indicates relationships between indirect marker of muscle damage. So in this slide, you can see very clear separation of the three groups who show small decrease in strength, maybe medium decrease in strength, large decrease in strength. So very uh, typical three groups. However, other indicator muscle damage overlapping each other. So when um, maybe we want to assess muscle damage, best indicator muscle damage strength loss. So if we can assess uh, athlete's strength loss after training, after competition, which can be the best, best indicator of muscle damage. So this is a little complicated, but maybe eccentric contraction can induce muscle damage, but probably maybe damage the fascia or endometrium extracellular matrix, then inflammation occurs, then that can result in soreness, swelling, decrease in range of motion, decrease in force. So these are indicator of muscle damage. We used to think that this is due to maybe increased calcium, and then actual destroy, uh, um, disruption of muscle fibers, but that may not be true because uh, as you saw in the previous slide, there's no indicator of muscle fiber damage so much. So we are now thinking that muscle damage are more responsible by fascia, endometrium, extracellular matrix damage. So why we get sore? So this is typical inflammation signs which is pain, redness, immobility, swelling, and heat. So for example, uh, like a COVID-19 or any kind of a bacteria or this is a tonsillitis, you can see your kind of a throat, like a here, very red and painful, then very difficult to swallow uh, water or uh, food, and then this is swelling as well, then you have a temperature. So these are typical um, indication of inflammation. So after eccentric exercise, we can get pain, DOMS, related on muscle soreness, and muscle strength loss, and something swelling. And if we can open the muscle, probably it's gonna be really red. And also when you touch your kind of damaged muscle, heat is also produced. So not damage itself, but inflammation can induce symptom muscle damage, like a sore, stiff muscles, swelling, and loss of muscle function. So inflammation is the cause of muscle damage. So muscle damage occurs after eccentric exercise, but when intensity is lower, not so much damage occur. High intensity eccentric contraction induces more damage. And also number of repetition is small, not so much damage, but large number of repetition, more damage occurs. If velocity is very slow, slow, sorry, slow eccentric exercise, not so much damage occurs, but fast one induces more damage. So this is very inter important. When you are doing eccentric contraction, short muscle length, for example, dumbbell is just from here to here, not so much damage occurs. But muscle stretched more, then more damage occurs. So we have more damage from arm muscles and leg muscles. So leg is always doing eccentric contraction, so they are getting used to eccentric uh, exercise. And also uh, in terms of age, uh, children have less damage than uh, young adults. And older adults have less damage than young adults. 
So it means that the children can do more eccentric exercise. And also we don't need to be afraid of so much damage for the older uh, elderly people. And gender difference exists. Normally female have less damage than male participants. This was uh, due to estrogen, which is a female hormone. And importantly, when we are doing a preconditioning exercise, a training, we have much less damage than without any training. So this is a kind of example of a comparison between the uh, four different muscles. So in this case, uh, this person did an elbow flexor eccentric exercise. So elbow flexor is stretched from here to here, okay, in 90 degrees to zero. So this is elbow extensor eccentric exercise. Elbow extensor is a kind of stretch from here to here. So also 90 degrees joint angle. So this one is a uh, knee flexor eccentric exercise. Knee flexors is stretched from here to here, 90 degrees. This is knee extensor eccentric exercise. Knee extensor is kind of stretched by bending the knee from here to here, 90 degrees. So when comparing these exercises, muscle soreness occurs more for arm muscles than leg muscles. The knee extensors has least muscle soreness than here yeah, uh, among them. And then knee flexors have a little more than knee extensors. This is also the case of strength loss. Strength loss is much greater for the arm muscles, but knee extensors do not show so much uh, strength loss. Knee flexors a little more, but not as much as um, arm muscles. So our uh, muscles, uh, elbow flexors, extensors, very similar, but knee flexors are next, and then knee extensors is least damaged muscle. This is the effect of aging. Uh, kind of, this is comparison between children and adolescent and also the adults. So of course, uh, adult people, adults are uh, stronger than adolescent and uh, pre-adolescent children. But when they did that, um, five sets of six maximum eccentric contraction uh, over the exercise strength decreased similarly between the group. Okay? And even for the young ones, okay, they are producing a lot of force eccentrically. Actually, the ratio between MVC and the peak eccentric force is much greater for the pre-adolescent than uh, adults. So they are doing their best. However, muscle soreness is, does not occur so much for the children and pre-adolescent also not so much uh, soreness. Adults have more soreness. Strength loss is also greater for the adults, followed by pre-adolescent, pre and children is the least, okay? So it means that the children have less damage than adults, and then pre-adolescent have it in the middle. So when we are getting older, we have more damage. However, when we get too old, like this is 75, 70 years old, we have less damage than young ones. And also soreness is also less. So we don't need to worry about so much for their damage uh, for elderly people, even they are doing their uh, maximum strength, uh, not so much damage occurs. This is the effect of flexibility training. Uh, this is a uh, st static stretching training or PNF training. And then uh, after training, we can see increasing range of motion for the stress stretching and PNF training, and also increasing strength by stretching and PNF, okay? Especially knee, uh, uh, knee extension, uh, so knee flexors uh, improve their strength. So then after this uh, flexibility training, they did eccentric exercise with the knee flexors. Then control group showed large decrease in strength, but um, flexibility training group showed less decrease in strength, also less soreness. So flexible muscle have less damage than stiff muscle. This is comparison between the trained and versus untrained athletes. So uh, this is uh, trained athletes did not show so much decrease in strength in comparison to the untrained subject. This is the resistance this is resistance train, this is no training. And, but interestingly, soreness is very similar between two groups. This also means that soreness does not tell us actual muscle damage so much. So I'm going to talk about repeated butt effect in next couple of uh, several slides. 
So when you are doing eccentric exercise today, then you get a large decrease in strength and slow recovery. You do the exact same exercise four weeks later, or even two weeks later, or eight weeks later, you can see much quicker recovery of strength, and also much less soreness, and no increase in creatine kinase and myoglobin after the second one. So this is called repeated bout effect. You are getting uh, less damage after the repeated bout eccentric exercise. So this is important. So this is okay. So you had a damage, then uh, you got that second eccentric exercise here. You have a strength loss here, but back to kind of a previous uh, baseline very quickly. So it means that this extra eccentric exercise did not exacerbate muscle damage or retard recovery process. So once you did the eccentric exercise, muscle damage did not occur additionally, and then the recovery process was not affected. But we cannot recommend maybe doing training here. But even if you are doing training here, it does not matter. It does not kind of exacerbate muscle damage like other injury. So this is kind of interesting. So repeated but effect occurs even after some maximal eccentric contraction. Of course, uh, if we are repeating the 100% eccentric exercise, this effect is greatest. But even if you are doing 40% eccentric exercise in the first bout, then doing 100% second bout, you can have about 20% reduction in muscle soreness, 50% reduction in the increase in creatine kinase of myoglobin, also like a 30% reduction in circumference, and then 60% reduction in the range of motion changes, maybe 15% decrease in uh, strength loss. So still 40% can work. So this is actually uh, data. So if you're doing a 10% eccentric exercise before the higher intensity one, you can enhance the recovery and you can reduce that muscle soreness. Also, you can reduce the increase in CK. So instead of doing a very high intensity eccentric exercise, you can maybe attenuate or reduce damage by doing very light intensity eccentric exercise. So if you are doing like a very light dumbbell, this is only like a two kilometer dumbbell, lowering the weight slowly, either two days, seven days, 14 days, 20 days before, this uh, maximal eccentric exercise, okay? What will happen? So actually 10% eccentric exercise did not induce any damage, no soreness, no strength loss. However, if we are doing 10% eccentric exercise prior to maximal eccentric exercise, we can enhance the recovery of strength, we can reduce muscle soreness, we can reduce increase in CK. However, if we are doing uh, this low intensity exercise more than three weeks before, no effect. So you just need to prepare for the maximum eccentric exercise, maybe within two weeks, but maybe one week would be better. Okay, so we can easily attenuate muscle damage by doing this kind of very low intensity eccentric contraction. So if you are athlete are kind of a concerning about muscle soreness or muscle damage, it is better to start from very low intensity eccentric exercise. Just one bout can work to attenuate muscle damage even after maximal eccentric exercise. Also, muscle contraction, this is isometric contraction at long muscle lengths can work. For example, we ask them to do maximal isometric contraction at this kind of extended joint angle for three seconds, then 10 reps, but two reps. Then after this one, uh, they do maximal eccentric exercise, either 50 minutes later, two days later, or four days later, seven days later. Control group did not have any isometric contraction before the uh, maximal eccentric contraction. So as you can see here, uh, whole control condition without any isometric contraction of muscle, uh, long muscle length, this is like a large decrease in strength, very slow recovery. But you are doing only two maximal contractions, two days before, you can see much faster recovery of strength. If you are doing 10 contractions, much faster. Muscle soreness is also very high after without any isometric contraction, 
10 doing a maximal eccentric exercise. But by doing two or 10 um, isometric contraction, you can reduce the soreness. Okay. But interestingly, if you are doing isometric contraction immediately before eccentric exercise, no effect. So you need to wait at least one day to have this kind of effect, which is important. So when you are doing, you are trying to do training, eccentric training, just doing a, 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 like a low intense eccentric contraction or maybe maximum isometric contraction at long muscle length, uh, immediately before eccentric exercise, it does not prevent muscle damage. You need to do those preconditioning exercise at least one day before exercise. But if waiting too long, like seven days before, no effect. So there are kind of small window of chance to reduce muscle damage. Okay. And then magnitude muscle damage is also attenuated by doing low intensity eccentric contraction, as I showed you. But if we are doing uh, isometric contraction at kind of a, a short muscle length, no effect. And if we are doing higher intensity eccentric contraction for the first part, greater protection effect. So probably you can start from low intensity, gradually increase the intensity, then you don't feel any soreness, then you can have the same training effect. So this is a, a example for the very low intensity eccentric contraction, which did not induce so much damage, small increase in CK, but if you're doing a 10%, then uh, after 10% eccentric exercise, then you are doing a whole body eccentric exercise, we cannot get any increase in CK and myoglobin. So 100% uh, protection by 10% eccentric contractions. So we don't know the exact mechanism for the repeated birth effect yet, but uh, possibly kind of neural adaptations, or muscle tendon complex adaptation, or extra cell metrics remodeling, and the inflammation uh, kind of adaptation. Maybe combination of these four parameters can reduce muscle damage after eccentric exercise. So mechanism is not kind of understood yet, but definitely you can start with low intensity eccentric contractions or isometric contraction at long muscle length before higher intensity eccentric one, then you can minimize muscle damage. So this is actually example of muscle damage from sports. So this is triathlon, Ironman triathlon, 3.8 kilometers swimming, 180 kilometers cycling, and full marathon. This is uh, called Ironman triathlon. So we had the opportunity to investigate 10 Ironman athletes uh, in this Ironman triathlon race. So this is the strength loss for the knee extensors from before the, the race to the one day post uh, race. So 30% decrease in knee extensor strength and 9% decrease in knee flexor strength. This is the average of the uh, 10 participants. And so on and so forth, this scale is 10 is maximum soreness and then zero is no soreness. Before a race, no soreness for the knee extensor muscle, knee flexor muscle, of the ankle flexor muscle. But after race, large increase, but not so bad, 10 is maximum. So maybe medium soreness. One day after exercise, two days, still the remaining. But large increase in blood markers muscle damage we saw after race. So we had the opportunity to investigate one triathlete. So he was my colleague at the Edith Cowan University. So his best time for this triathlon muscle race is about 10 hours. But on this day, his condition was not so good, especially it took a long time for him to finish the marathon. He can normally uh, run three and a half hours, but on this day, he had a cramp and many things happened and it took more than five hours to finish the marathon. Then total time was 11 hours, 38 minutes. So we just assessed them, assessed uh, these participants for several days after the exercise at the race. So strength decreased 38% immediately post-exercise, uh, 12 hours, 32%, but it back to normal by three days. Knee flexor is also back to normal by five days. So even after this kind of a uh, long kind of endurance uh, race, 
and his condition was not so bad, it's not so good, but he was able to recover at least for strength in maybe three to five days. And muscle soreness occurred after race, but uh, they are gone almost three to a week after the race. So theoretically, he could repeat triathlon every week, but that is not psychologically possible, but for the muscle kind of a recovery can be made in a week or so, even after triathlon race. So this is a data from a, a basketball. So we had the opportunity to investigate Brazilian National Female Basketball Championship. This is the last match of the year. So this is a championship match. So they are, uh, the team we are investigating won the championship. So in the basketball, okay, so uh, like a time to play is not that long. So the average time to, to play, actual playing time is only 18 minutes. And then RP, how hard exercise was is only four, not so hard. And CK increase, but not that big increase. And also amygdala increase, but not that huge increase either. So this is soreness. So uh, soreness occurred, but only 20 out of 100, very mild soreness. So this is one RM leg press. Leg press uh, strength decrease average of only 1%. Some people, some uh, show a little bit greater decrease, but not that big. And also bench press strengths did not show any decrease. Also T test, this agility test did not show so much uh, uh, decrease either. So it means that from basketball match, this is a very hard match, but muscle damage did not occur so much. So theoretically, basketball player can play basketball every day. This is a tennis example. We had the opportunity to also uh, investigate young tennis players. Their age is about 17 years old to 18 years old. So they are asked to play tennis match on the hard court for three hours. So they swap the kind of uh, opponent every one hour. So they continuously play three hours of tennis on the hard court. Okay. So this is a session RP was kind of high, like a six average. And so on so occurred after, one day after this tennis match, but only 18 out of 100, but just mild soreness. CK increased, but not so much high increase. Myoglobin also did not show so much high increase. But interestingly, one RM squat decreased about 35% 30, immediately post match, and still remaining 10% decrease at one day post match. Squat jump and counter movement jump also decrease immediately post exercise and also 24 hours. Not so much, but still 3% to 3% uh, decrease at one day post match. So which means that if they are doing next match one day after the first match, their performance may not be the best. So strength is less and jump performance less so they may not be able to play very well. So in tennis match tournament, they need to play maybe every day or every two days. So we need to consider how to recover from these matches faster. This is muscle damage after soccer match. So uh, in this particular study, uh, they investigate 24 elite male soccer players. They are training very hard every day. And then they compare between that uh, 10 players without any game and also 14 players who are in the match. So as you can see here, control group who did not have any uh, match, I mean a match play, did not show any decrease in vertical jump, but uh, players who play the match showed decrease in vertical jump, but very gradually uh, recovery. Also squat kind of a, um, um, strength also decreased more for the uh, people who played the match. And so it's also occurred for the only players who play the match. And also 20 meter sprint time also decreased. So about three days it took for them to back to normal. Or well, still maybe some of them four days. So after a match, soccer match, uh, it may take about four to five days to recover. So theoretically, if they have to have a, a top kind of performance, they cannot play soccer match every day. 
if they have to wait at least four or five days to do the next match. So how we can reduce muscle damage? So muscle damage can be reduced by repeated but effect, but even for top athletes, they have some damage. So we have to do something uh, before that uh, event, like a food is called prophylactic modalities, we can have warm up effect, stretching effect, or they are doing some massage before the uh, exercise, or taping, icing, acupuncture, or something like that, before the exercise. Or when they have any soreness or strength loss, we have a therapeutic modalities, uh, having some kind of a painkillers, or some kind of vibration, a massage, and other things or a combination of the two, okay? So, however, none of them, they are very strongly effective. So uh, you don't need to spend a lot of money for like a, any supplementation, other things. But we did some studies for uh, some treatment. So this is a microwave heat treatment. So we can just increase the muscle temperature before the exercise. So we can use this microwave, just like a, a microwave to cook uh, your meat or something. So we can increase the muscle temperature over 40 degrees by putting this one for 20 minutes, okay? So we can increase the muscle temperature. When muscle temperature increased one day before eccentric exercise, we can see faster recovery strength and less soreness, less change in the range of motion, like that. So it means that uh, you can heat up your muscle before exercise, not immediately before, but one day before exercise, you can have less damage. So for example, if you are going to have a, a long hiking, it may be better to have a very hot bath one day before going to hiking, which can reduce your soreness and damage. So this is curcumin. This is a kind of a curry powder. So uh, I think many people in India eat this one every day. So we are interested in the, how curcumin can have an effect on muscle damage, recovery, and also protection. So when we are doing, uh, having a curcumin um, uh, before the exercise and also uh, uh, during the recovery process, we can see enhanced recovery of the muscle strength, but muscle soreness is not affected by curcumin but CK was kind of reduced, increased like reduced by curcumin, but some effect. But this effect is not as great as repeated part effect. This is interesting one. So uh, if you have soreness in the morning, you started to walk, you feel less pain. This is what we try to investigate. So in this particular, so, sorry, that, uh, study, so uh, subjects performed light concentric exercise just that uh, bending and extending the elbow joint uh, kind of slowly for 25 minutes. So that just like a warm up exercise, okay? Then we saw soreness is reduced after this warm up exercise. So this means that maybe soreness is kind of reduced like a 50% reduction in the soreness. You are already sore before the uh, concentric exercise, but reduced and the second day, soreness is more, but reduced. Third day, reduced, also reduced. So about 30 to 40%, 50% decrease in soreness by doing uh, light concentric exercise. However, overall, soreness level did not uh, change. It was not, to be, was not affected by this light concentric exercise. So temporarily, muscle soreness is less, but this does not help us to enhance recovery from muscle soreness. So should muscle damage be treated? Muscle damage in athlete is minor, but could affect performance, just like a soccer or rugby or tennis, okay? We need to think about uh, maybe recovery. So without any treatment, DOMS disappears in a week. Also DOMS does not affect performance at all. Just pain muscle, painful muscle, does not reduce strength, so that does not affect performance so much. So most effective prophylactic treatment is preconditioning. So if you don't want to have soreness, you just need to precondition the muscle by uh, doing light eccentric contraction or maximal isometric contractions at long muscle lengths. However, enhancing recovery muscle function, muscle strength is very important to 
perform better in the next match or perform better for the training. So we need to care for recovery of muscle strength. Okay, this is very important. Unfortunately, treatment, good treatment to recover um, strength faster is not found yet. So we need more uh, kind of investigation to find very effective intervention to enhance muscle function recovery. So when we are going to introduce eccentric training, which could be, I mean, tomorrow I'm talking about beneficial effects of eccentric training. So maybe uh, introducing eccentric training uh, is, maybe we have to be a little bit careful. Maybe we have to start from isometric contraction at long muscle lengths, gradually introducing eccentric training. And then danger of motion is small to large, intensity, low intensity, large, uh, high intensity, number of potential small to large, velocity starting from slow velocity to the faster velocity. If you are keeping this kind of order, you can minimize muscle damage, then maximize the effect of eccentric training. So tomorrow, I mean, based on this talk, I'm going to focus more for the training aspects. That is more interesting for many, many coaches. So I'm talking about effect of eccentric training for health, fitness, and especially important thing is athletic performance. This is tomorrow's talk. I hope you can enjoy tomorrow's talk as well. So that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm welcome. Uh, I welcome any questions or comments. Mm -hmm. And then this is my email address. So you can maybe send me email if you want. So anyway, thank you very much for listening. Good. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Professor Ken. Uh, yep. it, was a, it was really a wonderful talk uh, with a lot of uh, research and evidence-based uh, testing and performance assessment. I uh, yep. really appreciate that uh, you have put in a lot of effort on to do so much of research on eccentric uh, exercise and have given a good insight to our coaching staff and mm -hmm. Uh, also the, our strength and conditioning experts. Right. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, now I ask uh, if there are any questions, uh, can you just uh, put it up in the chat box? Hmm. Right. I can see some. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some say good session. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, kind of, how can I stop this? So there are many kind of comments and, okay, so, okay, so lots of comments. So I I don't know which question I should choose. Can you choose any question? Okay, okay. hold on, hold on. Yeah. Uh, there was... Uh... So I have never experienced maybe talking to 400, more than 400 coaches by webinar. This is my first experience. So this is great. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. And then, yeah, thank you very much for the lot of comments. But yeah, kind of difficult to see, read questions. So too many, or maybe too many comments. How to, okay. Maybe one, I can notice how to take curcumin. So there are curry powder, or maybe there are supplementation. If you go to the uh, pharmacy, you can buy curcumin. But uh, some curcumin, um, curcumin is kind of absorbed better than other curcumin. So I don't know which is good, but maybe uh, people in India knows it better. There was, there was a question uh, on the periodization of eccentric strength. Could you please elaborate regarding the periodization of eccentric strength? Period, periodization, okay. That's a great question. So. Um, Right, so yeah, uh, maybe tomorrow I can talk more about that, okay? But yeah, so especially at the beginning, uh, it is better to avoid any muscle damage, muscle soreness. So maybe we can start from low intensity, then gradually increase the intensity. And then if, let's say, uh, just kind of similar to uh, normal resistance training, we can maybe increase the intensity. Then, 
at that increase, you can gradually increase the number of the repetitions. Then we can um, increase the uh, intensity again, then increase the number. But um, I don't see, I didn't see any good studies about peri periodization of the eccentric training yet. That may be new area of research, I think. Okay. So maybe I can learn from your coaches what is the best way to do eccentric training. Okay. So, there was, uh, sorry, yeah. so there was a question on what phase in periodization we can put eccentric training for strength of athlete, athletes. Yeah, right. That. Yeah. So actually tomorrow I'm going to talk more about eccentric training, but I think any phase is fine. And also, uh, I'm not sure whether this is also the case for athletes, but very low intense eccentric training can still improve strength. So um, any phase is fine. And also we can I mean, include eccentric uh, training for any phases, I think. Okay, but starting from very low intensity, that's it. So, uh, and also tomorrow, I'm going to show you very interesting data using eccentric exercise to prime performance. For example, you are doing eccentric training. Then after eccentric training, we have a, like a super compensation effect for some days. So jump, uh, you can jump higher after eccentric exercise. So uh, you can use eccentric training as priming exercise to improve your performance. I'm going to show you the data tomorrow. Okay, there is one, another question. At what age we can initiate eccentric strength training for males and, and females? Okay, At what? Uh, yeah, so I think any age is fine. Okay, so um, um, even, okay, so like a young kids, okay, they are already doing a lot of eccentric exercise. Uh, for example, they are have a, just praying, they stop, change the direction. They are already doing eccentric contraction using their own body weight. Well, sometimes they are jumped down from a very high place, then jumping down to the ground, they are doing eccentric contraction already. But more kind of a structured eccentric exercise, I don't know. But it is possible to introduce eccentric contraction or eccentric exercise, even they are very young, even they are like less than 10 years. So then uh, we didn't see any difference between the boy and the girls from the responses to eccentric uh, exercise in terms of muscle damage. So both showed much less damage than adults. So they are less susceptible to muscle damage. Okay, for example, I have a daughter uh, who is 14 years old. Okay, she's still young. So um, I started this experiment when she was three. So uh, on her birthday, she was lying on the floor like this, then bending her knees like that. I just asked her to keep this knee at this angle, but just stretch the uh, uh, hamstrings, okay? She did 100 times. And then next day I asked her whether you are, uh, her muscles are sore. When she was three, she didn't have any soreness. Four, no, five, no. Then when she became eight years old, she said, daddy, my, this muscle is sore. So she experienced soreness when she was eight, first time. And since then, each year, her soreness is getting worse. So interestingly, when uh, children are very small, they're young, they don't have so much damage or soreness at all. So it means that we can introduce eccentric contraction even when they are very small. Okay, uh, Professor, there is another question. Uh, this is from Ramesh Kamlesh Tiwana. Uh, mm -hmm. Eccentric exercise stimulate fast twitch fibers. What happens to slow twitch fibers? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think, okay, so, uh, so that is a uh, uh, muscle recruitment is uh, kind of depending on the intensity. So when we are doing high intensity contraction, both fast and slow twitch fibers are recruited, okay? But when we are doing very low intensity uh, contraction, only slow twitch fibers are recruited. So, when you are doing a very low intensity eccentric contraction, probably not so many muscle fast twitch fibers are recruited. But when we are doing high intensity eccentric contractions, 
yeah, both slow and high, uh, I mean, uh, slow and fast stitch fibers are recruited, then damaging more for the fast stitch fibers. So tomorrow I'm talking about how this is important for elderly people. When we get old, we lose fast stitch fibers, okay? But in order to stimulate fast stitch fibers, eccentric exercise would be a very good one. Yes, maybe, uh, maybe gradually increase the intensity. High intensity eccentric contraction is very important for elderly people to keep their fast stitch fibers. Does it, uh, I mean, if you're doing su uh, supra maximal uh, effort at, uh, for slow stitch fibers and fast stitch fiber, whether uh, the development would be there, even though if you're doing slow, I mean, uh, supra maximal exercises? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, supra maximal, yes, very high intensity when you are recruiting both, but slow stitch fiber never damaged, oh. even high intensity. So, the fibers are somewhat very strong. But uh, maybe the muscle fiber itself is not damaged, but maybe in between, if you are kind of doing eccentric contraction, maybe connective tissue, suddenly muscle fiber may be damaged or um, inflamed. Mm -hmm. But muscle fiber level, uh, throat stitch fibers never damaged, only fast stitch fibers. Okay, Professor, this is the last question. I think the time is running out uh, because we have another session. At the oh, okay, so, yeah, yeah. so you showed stretching improves further eccentric exercise training. Static stretching has been shown to decrease strength performance. Which type of stretching should be done before eccentric exercise sessions? Okay, that's a great question. Okay, so uh, in this case, okay. So static stretching can reduce muscle strength uh, like immediately after stretching. But maybe 15 minutes later, no problem. So uh, many people uh, think that maybe stretching should be avoided before doing jump or sprint, okay? But normally, when we do uh, stretching kind of warm up, then we have actual dynamic contraction later. Even though we are stretching muscle a lot, then we do the kind of dynamic contraction then effect of stretch is gone. So it means that uh, you don't need to worry about a negative effect of static stretching or dynamic stretching. But in my previous study, uh, I showed you, so we compared between the uh, PNF and static stretching. Both can reduce muscle damage similarly. But, um, and also uh, static stretching training for twice a week for uh, five weeks, could increase strength overall. So stretching exercise can also increase strength a little bit. So yeah, so maybe acute effect of stretching we have to consider, but maybe a chronic effect of stretching, it doesn't matter. All right, thank yeah. you, Professor Ken. It was a great session and uh, we really appreciate your effort in uh, spending your time and coming and uh, delivering the lecture for today. And we hope to see you tomorrow once again. It's yep. So see good. you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Mike. Yep. Thank you. So enjoy your session after this one. Yeah. Okay. One uh, announcement to participants. Uh, when you are actually registering your name, uh, please register your name in full and uh, also the center's name, which center you are from or, or to which center you belong. Please uh, register in full name. People without, I mean, uh, like OPPO, Galaxy, or some numbers are coming means we will not register. Uh, we will not entertain you into the program. Please, so please uh, stick on to the uh, regulations of the uh, this webinar. And another thing, okay, we have our second session at 4 p.m. So the session, I mean, uh, the Zoom will be opened at 3:45. So please log in at the earliest. Thank you very much. See you at 4 p.m. Thank you, Professor. Okay, see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Okay, sir, I need a meeting, sir.